Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lab Manager's Tech Trends webinar series. My name is Trevor Henderson, Technology Editor for Lab Manager, and I will be moderating today's discussion, which will focus on the latest trends and innovations in microplate technology. Today we have a panel consisting of five leading industry specialists who will share their perspectives on some of the latest improvements in microplate technology design, automation, and data integration. We like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to send us your questions at any point during the presentation, and the panelists will address these during the question and answer session following the presentations. To ask questions, simply type your query into the question box located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as possible during the Q&A session. However, if we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to the panelists, and they can respond to you directly. Additional resources can be accessed through the resource widget, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You may also move or resize any of the windows simply by grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right corner. At this time, you may need to move or minimize some of the open windows to see the live view. This webinar recording will be available early next week on Lab Manager's website. At the end of this webinar, we'll share that link with you as well as the contact information for all of our panelists. With that, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Carl Peters is a microplate reader senior application scientist with BMG Lab Tech. He obtained a PhD in cell and molecular biology from Northwestern University while studying protein kinase C signaling. He also has a BS in biology from Hastings College. Prior to BMG Lab Tech, he was an adjunct professor of biology at Roosevelt University and subsequently a clinical assistant professor in the School of Molecular Biosciences at Washington State University. Thank you for joining us today, Carl. Thank you for the introduction, Trevor, um, and thank you to all of you for attending. So for my portion of today's webinar, I will be telling you about the Clario Star. Um, the Clario Star uses a linear variable filter monochromator for wavelength selection, and I hope that by the end of my presentation, you will, be, you will better understand what an L LVF monochromator is, how it is different from traditional monochromators, and why LVF monochromators are more sensitive So here is a diagram of a traditional monochromator in which light is passed through slits and gratings are used to select the uh, wavelength of light. Now since the band pass in these types of instruments is determined by the slit width as the light exits the monochromator and, that, and this width is usually fixed, the band passes for these instruments are usually fixed. And this can be detrimental um, because some dyes emit very broadly. Um, and with, when you're working with uh, dyes that emit in the red spectrum, uh, they can be difficult to optimize with these fixed band passes. By contrast, the LVF monochromator, which is depicted here, allows for adjustable band passes between 8 and 100 nanometers. Um, this diagram of the inner workings of the Clario star uh, gives you a bit of an idea of how wavelength selection can be performed in both the excitation and emission sides, where linear variable filter slides are moved uh, in, in order to select the wavelength and band pass of your choice. I hope that this diagram will give you a better appreciation for how the wavelength selection is performed in the Clario star. As light passes through the instrument, it passes through successive linear variable filters. One is a short wave wavelength pass filter, and the other is a long wavelength pass, pass filter. These essentially select the trailing and leading edge of light that is being used by the instrument. So as an example, let's look at what, what sort of settings could be used on a traditional monochromator uh, to perform detection of M-cherry. The M-cherry excitation and emission profile is shown here, overlaid with a 9 nanometer band pass for both excitation and emission. With the Clary Star's ability to adjust the band pass, the best possible combination of excitation and emissions can be used. Um, looking at the same die for, uh, for with the Clary Star, the Settings can be optimized with a 20 nanometer excitation 
with a 20 nanometer excitation uh, bandpass and a 40 nanometer uh, emission bandpass. Um, I'd like to take a moment and digress to another unique feature of the Clarion Star, which is its linear variable dichroic. I believe, in my opinion, the uh, importance of the dichroic is underappreciated. Dichroics uh, prevent excitation and unwanted light from reaching the detection stage. In the example displayed, um, which would be appropriate for detection of fluorescein, a 505 nanometer long pass dichroic is used. And this serves the purpose of uh, deflecting the 400 485 nanometer excitation light onto the sample in the well, while allowing the emission light at 520 nanometers to pass through the dichroic and onto the detector. Without an adjustable dichroic, the proper dichroic would, would need to be installed, or a 50-50 beam splitter could be placed in, in place of the dichroic. However, this would lead to a reduction in sensitivity. So in essence, with the linear variable dichroic, it's like having, uh, like having hundreds of different dichroics in the reader, but they're ready for you at any time. So in addition to having the ability to adjust the band passes, the LBF monochromator is actually also more efficient at transmitting light, um, and this will also lead to an improvement in sensitivity. So now I would like to uh, address why uh, linear variable filter monochromators have greater light transmission. So loss of desired light is is going to occur in any of these systems. However, if you limit the amount of, uh, of light that is lost, that will lead to an improvement in sensitivity. And shown here is um, the light loss of the linear variable, the LVF monochromator and double monochromator um, as it passes through the instrument. As light moves through the LVF monochromator, 20% of that light is lost. And that's uh, depicted by the decrease in bars one, from bars one to two. As light is then subsequently uh, reflected down onto the sample by the dichroic, an additional 10% of light is lost. So 72% of the desired light actually reaches the sample in the LVF monochromator system. Um, and then that same light is, is going to travel back up towards the, um, the, the PMT um, as emission signal. And essentially, the uh, light will pass through the same, uh, the same filters, the same dichroic, as it moves towards the filter. So an additional 72% of the light will be lost. Um, so the final transmission efficiency of the, mo of the LVF monochromator is about 51%. On the, the right-hand side, you can see the results for a double monochromator. Um, and as the excitation grading system diffracts, diffracts the light, um, it leads to a 64% loss in desired light. Subsequently, the fiber optics lead to loss of an additional 25% of, of light, so that by the time light reaches the sample, only 27% 20, of the desired light is actually reaching the sample. Again, uh, in order to perform detection, essentially the, uh, the, the whole series of steps is reversed so that the total efficiency of the system is about 7% for a double monochromator. So as you can see, this means that the LVF monochromator present in the Clario star has seven, about seven times more light transmission than the double monochromator. So, but what does this mean to you in terms of sensitivity? Well, with the ability to have this greater light transmission, you're able to set your gain settings lower. And this will um, invariably lead to a lower variation in the blanks, which will be reflected in greater sensitivity as determined by the limit of detection. And if you compare instrument performance based on LOD for fluorescein, as shown here, um, it certainly seems to reflect the improved performance of the Clario star. And these results are based on 
uh, the results that are published on different companies' websites. So this certainly seems to reflect the improved sensitivity of the ClariaSARS monochromator, um, and um, this, we believe, is a result of the improved transmission efficiency as well as the ability to select the appropriate bandpass for an individual fluorophore. And the, the data that is now um, being produced seems to reflect this as well. So as additional com data is coming in, it certainly supports the idea that having higher transmission and adjustable bandpass is important. In Promega's Nanobret system, the Claristar is the only monochromator they tested which is capable of detecting this assay reliably. Shown here are the results that, that Promega produced um, looking at the arginine vasopressin receptor and its natural association with arrestin as a part of its activation cycle. Um, the BRET ratio will increase as the arrestin associates with the receptor, uh, and this is going to happen in response to increasing concentrations of agonists, as shown in um, each of these graphs. And again, the Claristar monochromator was deemed the only one uh, suitable for performing this detection reliably. Finally, we have recently been able to show that a larger band pass improves signal to blank ratio in a fluorescence intensity test. Um, the results shown here are M cherry expression um, at varying cell numbers as indicated. Um, and all of these tests were performed with the Claristar with the main, with, uh, with a change in the band pass of the um, emission settings selected to, for comparison's sake. As you can see, uh, using the 40 nanometer band pass improves the signal to blank ratio at all cell numbers. The, the improvement is about 20% at all cell numbers, and you can imagine that with lower signal, as a result of lower cell number or lower expression, this uh, difference would become extremely important. So with that, I would like to thank you again for your attention, um, and I will close with just a few acknowledgments. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the, the German engineers that designed the Clario Star. Uh, they have made uh, a, a, an instrument that is easy for me to talk about. Uh, in addition, I would like to thank the application scientists around the globe um, who continue to find new ways of using the Clariostar. And finally, I'd uh, like to especially thank uh, Dr. Thomas Macklight uh, from Promega, who provided the NanoBret data that I presented. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carl. And thank you all for sending your questions. I encourage you to continue to do this throughout the presentations. If you're joining us late, uh, you may ask questions simply by typing your query into the question box, which is located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Our next speaker today uh, joins us from Biotech. Brad Larson is a principal scientist at Biotech Instruments, where he has worked for over four years. His roles include optimizing new drug discovery assay chemistries and cell culture models on Biotech's line of automation, microplate detection, and imaging instrumentation. He has worked for more than 15 years with numerous automation and detection platforms to optimize a variety of assays in the drug discovery field, including kinase, GPCR, epigenetics, drug metabolism, toxicity, and antibody therapeutic assays. His current work has led to publications in assay and drug development technologies, the Journal of Laboratory Automation, the Journal of Biomolecular Screening, and Combinatorial Chemistry and High Throughput Screening, among others. He's also presented his work at numerous conferences across the U.S. and Europe. Thank you for joining us today, Brad. Thank you, Trevor, and uh, thank you, everyone, for join, uh, joining us today. So um, as, uh, as Trevor mentioned, I'm a, a principal scientist in the applications group at Biotech. So um, what I'd like to do is to talk about um, some different instrumentation uh, today as well as uh, show you different ways that we've, uh, we've used that instrumentation. So as, uh, to, be to begin with, as most of you know by now, uh, it's widely accepted that incorporation of 3D cellular structures 
into experimental procedures, has the ability to deliver uh, more in vivo-like results, and uh, could also lower the failure rate of new uh, molecules in the drug discovery process. Therefore, uh, what I'd like to do over the next 10 to 15 minutes is to tell you about uh, biotech's uh, liquid handling and inst uh, imaging instrumentation and tell you about how it can simplify as well as increase the robustness of uh, multiple different methods and applications using cells cultured into 3D structures. So I'll start by telling you about uh, two different instruments uh, that were incorporated for liquid handling as well as imaging. Those include the Citation 3 cell imaging multimode reader and the Multiflow FX multimode uh, dispenser. Then we'll take a look at some of the applications work that we've done in this area which incorporated these instruments and either scaffold-based or non-scaffold uh, spheroid-based uh, 3D cell models. Okay, so the first instrument that you see here is the Citation 3, which is our uh, new cell imaging multimode uh, reader. And as you can see by the cutout um, on the left of the slide, the instrument contains uh, three different uh, detection modes. Those include uh, in the orange is the monochromator-based detection system, in the blue is the filter-based detection system, and then below in the yellow is a digital uh, wide field um, imaging system. So the mono monochromators, um, as we've just heard uh, uh, previously, um, as you know, give you the, the greatest uh, flexibility as far as choosing different uh, wavelengths for excitation and emission. Uh, the, the system shown here contains quadruple monochromators, and again, uh, allows you to pick uh, any different uh, excitation or emission wavelengths wavelength that you uh, that you choose. Uh, and this system can be used for both both uh, top or bottom uh, reading. The filter-based system uh, incorporates a direct optical system, so there's no fiber guides uh, in between the uh, excitation source and the filters and acroic mirrors, which are in the, the cube, the double cube that you see, uh, and then also no fibers between the, uh, the filters and the, uh, and the PMT that's used for detection. So it gives you the greatest uh, sensitivity. Um, obviously, the, the monos will be able to be used for, uh, for many different uh, types of applications, but if you're using a fluorophore or some other uh, assay which gives you a relatively weak signal, then uh, the use or the incorporation of the the, uh, the filters can, um, can give you that greater sensitivity that's required. And then below is the, uh, the digital imaging, uh, imaging system that includes a CCD camera with a Sony 16-bit chip. Uh, it also includes uh, imaging uh, filter cubes, which contain colored LEDs for excitation, um, and as well as uh, excitation and emission filters and acroic mirrors again, to ensure that uh, proper, uh, proper wavelengths are used for the appropriate dye that's being used. Up to four filter cubes uh, can be put into the system at one time, which gives you the ability to image with uh, uh, four different fluorescent channels as well as bright field in one experimental procedure. Uh, the system also contains an objective turret, as you can see, which can hold up to two objectives at a time. And those, uh, the objectives that can be placed into the system range from 2.5 up to 60x. So put together, obviously, this gives you a system that uh, gives you the, uh, the, the power to generate both quantitative numerical data as well as phenotypic data from your samples. Uh, in addition, because there's such a demand to perform assays with live cells in a non-destructive manner or run kinetic assays to track uh, uh, changes in signal over time, the instrument also contains temperature control up to 45 degrees Celsius and can come with a gas control module which can control either CO2 or O2 levels. Therefore, you can insert a plate um, into the reading and imaging chamber with the temperature uh, previously set to 37 degrees Celsius and CO2 set to 5 uh, percent, and you can read or image kinetically uh, with no risk of sacrificing sample integrity or 
force to really. The second instrument is the multi-flow effects, which as you can see is a multi-mode uh, dispenser and plate washer. So it contains our parallel dispense technology, which uh, combines um, up to two A-tip non-contact par uh, peristaltic pump dispensers and two variable tube uh, syringe pumps uh, that can be uh, used for dispensing into six up to 1536 well plates. And then it also contains um, an optional, uh, optional wash module uh, which again uh, gives you the capability to wash plates for ELISAs um, or uh, be used with Luminex types of assays or to perform medium uh, exchanges or buffer washes for cell-based applications and that can be used with uh, plates uh, from uh, 6 well up to 384 well. And all the, the cassettes that are used with the peri pump can be, uh, the whole thing can be completely autoclaved for sterility and the lines for the syringe pumps as well as for the wash module can be chemically sterilized. So again, the instrument can be easily inserted into offline into a tissue culture hood and you can use it for uh, sterile cell-based um, assay procedures and again, not uh, worry about sacrificing uh, sample integrity. Okay, so let's switch gears now and talk about uh, the ways that we've integrated these instruments with uh, different applications and procedures. So the, the first application uh, involved using uh, the multi-flow effects to perform the liquid handling steps of uh, 3D signal transduction assay, and then also the, uh, involved the use of the Citation 3 to perform microplate reading and imaging. We used the RAFT 3D cell culture system, which is from a company called TAP Biosystems, uh, based out of the UK. This is a scaffold-based uh, 3D technology, and the system works in the following way. You add your cells to a collagen mixture, which you see in the top left uh, picture, and uh, the, uh, the plate then is um, put into a tissue culture incubator for 15 minutes. After that time, the plate is removed and you add the, the raft absorber plate, which you see in the top middle figure. Uh, the, each of the individual absorbers are porous so that the medium can uh, be wicked into the absorbers, but the cells uh, and the collagen are left uh, behind. <clears throat> So d during that process, after the absorber plate is added, the, um, the whole set of the two plates is placed back into the incubator for another 15 minutes. During that time, again, the medium is absorbed, which leaves a 120 micron thick uh, hydrogel behind. And then you can add a uh, fresh medium and the rest of the assay is basically performed like uh, like a 2D assay. So again, all those steps were uh, automated, uh, including the cell collagen dispensing, performing medium exchanges, uh, dispensing compounds, and then adding the assay components from the SysBio HTRF assay that we used were all done with the multi-flow FX. Uh, to validate the automated procedure, we performed a Z prime. Uh, experiment. We used two different concentrations of an inhibitor for the uh, um, for the target protein EIF4E, and you can see with the graph on the right uh, with the um, uh, the data from the positive and the negative control yielding a Z prime value of 0.73, which is excellent for uh, for uh, for an, for any assay, uh, in particular for a cell based uh, for a cell based assay. Okay, moving on. So in addition to scaffold-based technologies, non-scaffold-based uh, spheroids are also widely uh, used in uh, for 3D cell models. Uh, they provide a representative model, obviously, for in vivo tumors or tissues and uh, can uh, be relatively easily formed. Uh, hanging drop methods of spheroid formation are quite popular and a number of different vendors exist uh, which offer hanging drop plates uh, for this purpose. However, it isn't always easy to to determine when the cells have finished the aggregation process. Um, some cell lines aggregate very quickly, whereas others, uh, such as the MCF7 cells that I'm showing here, take multiple days uh, to complete the aggregation process. So with the incorporation of the Citation 3, 
uh, this concern and difficulty then uh, becomes eliminated and it's easy to track the uh, spheroid formation and the hanging drops. Um, the, the hanging drop plate that I'm showing in the bottom uh, right corner, uh, which was used, is from uh, 3D Biomatrix. And uh, imaging of the spheroids in the hanging drops can either be performed manually or automated with a Citation 3, either using Brightfield, which is shown here, or with fluorescent uh, channels if your cells uh, happen to be expressing a certain uh, fluorescent protein. Uh, the entire hanging drop plate assembly, which is, includes the, the plate, the tray, and the lid, can uh, easily be placed into the imaging chamber, which again is uh, uh, set to 37 degrees and 5% CO2. The imager can then focus through the bottom tray and up to the level of the spheroids in the drop. Uh, and then this uh, z-height can then be entered as the imaging bottom of the plate to enable automated imaging. Uh, the cells, as you can see here, that were imaged um, were 5,000 cell uh, spheroids uh, from the MCF7 cell line, and uh, aggregation was tracked uh, once every 24 hours over a total of four days, and you can see by the end of day four that a nice spheroid of roughly one millimeter um, in diameter uh, has been formed. So it's then ready to be used in uh, the appropriate assay procedure. This process can also be used with ultra-low attachment uh, um, spheroid plates, uh, such as the, uh, the one um, here from Corning, which is their uh, ULA uh, spheroid plate. Um, and here, uh, instead of the cells aggregating in a hanging drop, they aggregate at the bottom of the round uh, well. So a single Z height can again be entered to, uh, to allow for proper focusing. And again here you can see I'm using uh, 5,000 uh, HCT116s uh, for this process and we imaged uh, the cells once per hour over a 24 hour period with, uh, with a 4X um, objective. And what I'm going to show here, and hopefully it works, is a video clip of the aggregation process, and that's, this is a movie uh, that shows um, a combination of the uh, kinetic images, again, that were captured over the 24-hour uh, the period. So you can see how easily it is, er, it can be, um, it, it is to, uh, to track this, uh, the uh, spheroid formation process. Okay, another example of the way that the Citation 3 can be incorporated is uh, to improve the uh, assay performance or the assay window uh, through uh, microscopy compared to typical uh, PMT-based uh, detection. So in this um, uh, example uh, here, what we did was we added spheroids uh, to a plate. Uh, they had been previously treated with uh, hypoxia red dye from uh, Enzo Life Sciences, and then the um, uh, the, the spheroids were uh, exposed to a hypoxic condition uh, environmentally by sparging in nitrogen into the imaging chamber, which uh, led to a, an O2 concentration of 8%. Uh, percent. Um, so, and then what we did was we imaged uh, the spheroids uh, again kinetically once per hour. You can see the four uh, time points that are shown uh, here at uh, time zero, and then after three, six, and 11. Um, hours of incubation and the change in signal uh, over that time. So then if we look at the graph on the uh, bottom right, uh, the black line shows detection using PMT-based uh, technology again. And uh, basically it's, it's very obvious to see that very little change, full change, is, uh, is detected over that time. And if you look at the figure above the graph, you can see that's the, the typical size of a 96 well plate well. And the small dot is the relative size of a um, of a spheroid compared to that total well. So even though to our eye it seems like a very large change in fluorescence to a PMT because the rest of the well is black, that uh, that change in fluorescence really gets uh, gets lost. So you don't see any fold change. Then by incorporating imaging with uh, both the LED excitation and the CC-based um, uh, capture of the signal and being able to focus in uh, 
to a smaller portion of the well, we see how this is able to um, slowly increase the, uh, the fold change. We see a slight increase with 4x um, uh, imaging, and then with 10x, which uh, the images, the pictures that you see of the spheroids uh, are um, images that were captured with the 10x magnification, you see you know, a more dramatic uh, ch uh, fold change. So the, um, the ability to really uh, focus in a much smaller uh, portion of the well definitely helps uh, increase the, um, the robustness of the assay. But then what we can further do is with the use of our Gen 5 technology, we can perform a cellular analysis and draw an object mask automatically around the, um, the spheroid using changes in uh, fluorescence and object size so that in this way only the change in fluorescence within the object mask is then detected and all the other uh, uh, signal from all other portions of the well are then ignored. And you can see from the blue line in the graph that this makes a dramatic increase and you can really then go from a point where you didn't see any change to you know a point where you can you can see a nice robust change in uh, in the signal and really get a a good idea of what's uh, what's happening with uh, with your assay over time. And then the final example that I want to tell you about is how again the Citation 3 can help to uh, simplify the cellular analysis um, from different uh, complex 3D assay processes. So what I'm showing here is a tumor invasion assay. These are um, spheroids that were made from a combination of MDA, MB231, and fibroblast cells uh, put into, again, using the, the Corning ULA plate uh, with a major gel overlay, and then we added CXCL12 as the chemoattractant and then tumor invasion was tracked over a period of uh, five days. And you can see, obviously, the, the dramatic change in the invasion that's uh, occurring over that five-day period. But, you know, tracking this change um, isn't always easy. Um, you know, do you, you, know, do you uh, especially with bright field, are you able to, you know, really detect the, uh, the changes in, the, um, in the, the tumoroid or the cells that are uh, invading away? So, again, with the use of the... Uh, um, with the, the use of the Gen 5 data analysis software, again, we're able to look at changes in um, here just using changes in the bright field signal, but this can also be done with fluorescence. And you can draw uh, object masks around both the, uh, the original tumoroid structure as well as the invadopodia, which are the, uh, the structures that form um, uh, kind of the pr projections out coming out of the original tumoroid uh, that, that move out into the matrix. We can draw object masks around this uh, total invasion uh, type of structure and then look at changes either um, in, the, uh, in uh, um, the bright field signal or in area. What I'm showing here in the graph is uh, changes in the bright field signal from the original tumoroid structure uh, at time zero and then at the different time points out to 120. You can see obviously the dramatic uh, increase in uh, bright field signal and then if we look at the signal ratio, um, again, it's a, it's a very dramatic change um, in signal. So it's a very easy way, this can be automated uh, to, um, to allow you to, uh, to really get an idea of what's going on um, in uh, the, in the invasion process. So with that, I'll finish up. I realize this is a very high-level, uh, quick overview. If you have any other uh, questions or desire to get more information, you can look on our resources page on the biotech.com uh, webpage and uh, uh, take a better look at the different application notes and other resources that exist there. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Brad. And just a reminder that this webinar video will be available early next week on Lab Manager's website. If you would like a copy of the presenter's slides, we suggest that you reach out to them individually via email. Their contact information will be available at the end of the presentations. Uh, we're fortunate to have two speakers joining us today from Molecular Devices. Celeste Glazer is currently the product manager for the Spectrumax i3 microplate reader and Minimax 300 imaging cytometer at Molecular Devices. Formerly, Celeste was an application scientist at a lab site where she focused on miniaturized genomic applications. Additionally, Celeste has a broad range of experience in cell-based assays. Also joining us is Kathy Olson. 
Kathy has been an application scientist at Molecular Devices since 2004, where she developed a broad range of applications for microplate-based detection systems, including cell-based biochemical and imaging applications. Kathy has a PhD from UC Davis in cell and developmental biology, where she studied the role of forkhead genes in ischidian development. For her postdoc research, Kathy showed how transformation affects normal growth process of human memory epithelial cells and the role of hedgehog interacting protein in hedgehog pathway cell signaling. Thank you for joining us today, ladies. Thank you. So today I want to tell you about a way to manage your lab with one complete system. It's a total hardware, software, and re reagent solution that allows you to investigate cellular pathways and protein activation. So the Spectrum X system allows you to monitor cell confluence by using a transmitted light system as well as follow viability and toxicology biochemically with a two-color imaging system and then follow on that looking at protein activation, phosphorylation, as well as expression with the Western Blark cartridge system. So the Spectrumax i3 Minimax with scan later is a traditional multimode plate reader with absorbance, fluorescence, and luminescence with the expanded capabilities of cartridge, which enables common applications such as alpha screen, HDR, HDRF, TR fret, but with some new novel applications uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today, including the Western blot detection and quantification and nano TRF. But an additional capability that we're going to talk about today as well is the Minimax system, which enables you to do transmitted light measurements, red and green fluorescence, all quantitatively using the SoftMax Pro system. This is all complemented by a set of optimized assay kits that are um, including cell integrity, toxicity, toxicity, cardiomyocyte detection, and the scan later reagent kit system. So the Spectrumax Minimax is our imaging cytometer and cellular analysis system, and it combines cellular imaging and microplate analysis in a single workflow. So you're able to count cells and measure confluence without using harmful dyes. And it's a way that we've uh, patented that allows you to quantify those measurements. You can then expand on that capability looking at viability and toxicity applications with the red and green um, channel functionality which is all captured using our SoftMax Pro software and is analyzed um, all in one system. So you acquire and analyze those with one software. The Scan Later Western Block cartridge is an additional capability and it's, it's really novel in that you don't have to have a chemiluminescent substrate. We, we have a set of reagents that complement the system and it basically allows you to follow your traditional workflow where you, you uh, run your gel, you blot the system, but you use a unique europium labeled secondary antibody and that, that europium label enables you to have a broad fluorescence detection range that is actually uh, more sensitive than chemiluminescence. And what's nice about it as well is that once you've, you add it, you, um, you are able to have a 30-day uh, shelf life for that blot, so you can run it more than one day. And again, all the acquisition analysis is fully controlled by SoftMax Pro, so you're able to get those results immediately. So I'm going to hand this off to Kathy, who's going to tell you how she used all these tools to look at heat shock response uh, in a couple of cell lines, the CHO and HeLa cell lines. Okay. Hello. I'd like to talk to you about the examination that we did of the heat shock response in mammalian cells on the Spectrumax system. So. In mammalian cells, there are a number of cellular responses to heat shock, and by heat shock, I mean exposing the cells to a temperature that's higher than their normal gross temperature of 37. And some of the pathways that are induced in response to heat shock in these cells include cell death pathways, including apoptosis, and also cell survival pathways. So there's different balances of these different pathways in different cell lines. And so we wanted to investigate that in the CHO and the HeLa cells. So along the way, the different pathways that we can investigate using the Spectrumax system would include morphological changes in the cells in response to heat shock. We can monitor that by imaging, and I'll show you some transmitted light images of those cells. We can also monitor cell viability using our fluorescence imaging assay. 
we can look at apoptosis to get a little bit more insight into the mechanism of what's happening with the cell viability. And finally, we can look at protein induction. And in particular, I'll show you induction of HSD70, the heat shock protein, which is involved in heat shock response and also in cell survival. So here's the workflow. And again, all analysis was done on the Spectrumax system. So the, the health, these, <laughs> the heat shock cells are HeLa and Cho cells. And they were heat shocked for 90 minutes at 45 degrees Celsius. And at that point, immediately after the heat shock was complete, we assessed the morphology using TL or transmitted light imaging. And then we allowed the cells to recover for about six hours at 37 degrees, so putting them back in their normal growth conditions to allow recovery before proceeding with some additional assays, which are cell count, cell viability, and apoptosis assays. Finally, in parallel, we collected cell extracts from plates that were also heat shocked for the same amount of time and allowed to recover for six hours and ran a Western blot and then probed for HSD70 using the scan later Western blot detection system. So the first thing we looked at was the cell morphology. And again, this is immediately after the heat shock period of 90 minutes is complete. And on the top row, I'm showing you the Cho K1 cells. On the bottom, I'm showing you the HeLa cells. On the left-hand side are the control cells, which were grown at 37 degrees. And on the right-hand side are the heat shock cells, which were treated at 45 degrees. So the cells were imaged in the transmitted light channel of the Minimax cytometer. And what we can see immediately, just by looking at the images, is that you see a higher percentage of cells are actually rounded in the CHO-K1 population in response to the heat shock. And the yellow arrow is pointing out a cell that's got the rounded morphology, which is indicative or suggestive of apoptosis, which we'll investigate a little bit later. So in the bottom image, the green arrow is pointing to one of the cells in the HeLa population, which still is showing a more flattened and normal morphology. So there's some rounding, but you see a lot more of it in the CHO cells in response to the heat shock. So we can start quantifying these kind of responses. So now I'm going to show you some cell counts that were measured on the Minimax system. And these counts were obtained using the stain free, which is our patented technology for analyzing transmitted light images in SoftMax Pro. These images were taken six hours after heat shock, so they've been allowed to recover. And we're doing this, these cell counts in the CHO and the HeLa cells. And that's all quantified in the graphs on the right. So the top graph is for the CHO K1 cells. And you'll see that on the, uh, the y-axis, I'm graphing the cell counts. And then on the x-axis, I've got three different representative experiments. So these represent different initial seeding densities. So we're not only monitoring proliferation of cell counts, but we're also able to optimize the assay um, by checking different cell densities and how cells at different densities will respond to heat shock. So that's what those three sets of bars are. And all the blue bars are representing control cells at 37 degrees. And the red bars are representing the heat shock cells. So in the CHO-K1, you can see that regardless of density, whenever we heat shock them, we end up with fewer cells after six hour recovery. And that's a pretty dramatic difference there. In the HeLa cells, there's also a reduction in cell counts after heat shock, but it's a little bit less dramatic. So they seem to have a less of a response to the heat shock in terms of how many cells are present after a six hour recovery period. So to look a little bit deeper into what's happening with these cells, we can quantitate their cell viability. Now this was done using the Early Talk Cell Integrity Kit, which is a kit from molecular devices. It was developed and optimized for the Minimax imaging cytometer. So it's, it's ideal to use it along with that system. And again, I'm showing you the CHO-K1 cells are the two images on the top row, and the HeLa cells are the two on the bottom row. And again, with the control 37 on the left, 45 degrees on the right. And the way this kit works is that there's a red nuclear dye, which permeates all cells and labels each and every cell in the population. And there's an additional green nuclear dye, which can only enter and stain the dead cells. So what you're seeing in these images is all the red cells are live. And anything that shows up as green is a dead or dying cell. And it has a compromised cell membrane, so it's allowing that green dye to enter. So the graphs on the right are showing percent dead cell versus the initial seeding density for the cells. So you're, again, you're looking at blue for control cells and red bars for heat shock. So we can see in the CHO K1 cells that the, there's a very dramatic increase in the number or the percent of dead cells in the populations when the cells are heat shocked. 
And then in the HeLa cells, there's a much more modest increase in percent dead cells. So we can clearly see that between these two cell lines, even though we're heat shocking them for the same amount of time, there's a clear difference in the response and the amount of viability change that occurs in the two lines. So to investigate a little bit deeper into what the mechanisms of the cell death may be, we look at the apoptotic response. So for this, we're using an assay for caspase 3 and 7, and that is an enzyme that's induced as part of the apoptotic cell death pathway. This is a green fluorescent assay, and what it does is it goes in and labels each and every one of the apoptotic cells in the population. So here I'm showing just some zoomed in images, some representative fields of the different cells. And again, show on top, ELA on bottom, control on the left, and 45 degree heat shock on the right. And then we're quantitating that. So we can have the imaging software identify those green expressing cells and count them up. So we're graphing apoptotic cell count on the y-axis, and then again, our heat shock versus our control cells. So again, you see a really dramatic increase in the apoptotic cell count in the CHO cells, and a less dramatic or almost insignificant increase in apoptosis for the HeLa cells. So this gives us some interesting insights in what kind of pathways are being activated in the cells in response to heat shock and can give us some clues for further hypotheses to investigate in these two cell lines. So finally, we also wanted to look at induction of the heat shock protein 70 in both cell lines. And to do that, we use the ScanLater Western Blot Detection System. So what I'm showing here are cell extracts that were collected from CHO K1 and HeLa cells and treated and untreated in the different lanes. And um, so we're showing also the protein ladder on the right-hand side. That's a scan later reagent that's also offered. And a loading control on the bottom to show that the loading was equal for all samples. So we can see that there's a pretty dramatic induction in HSP70 in the choke ones that were heat shock treated. And in the HeLa cells, it's an interesting case because they're already expressing a fairly large amount of the HSP70. And then in response to heat shock, they further increase the amount that they're expressing. So we can definitely quantitate that using the scan later system. And that's what I'm showing in the graph on the right. So in the CHO K1, we can quantitate that difference in band intensity by calculating the integrated density of those bands. And I'm showing that here. And we, we find that there's about a nine-fold increase in HSP70 uh, expression in the heat shock population. And then in the HeLa, it's, it's a very different situation. We do see an increase, but because there was such a high amount expressed already in those cells, we only see about a 1.8-fold induction of the protein. So we can quantitate that, and again, that can lead us to make hypotheses about what pathways are activated and what we should investigate further. So I wanted to conclude by emphasizing that we do offer a complete solution for looking into pathways. and. This is all done on the SpectrumX system. We're able to investigate cell morphology and cell counts using the stain-free technology, which is something you can do before even adding or without adding any dyes of any kind to the cells. We were able to monitor cell viability using our early tox cell integrity kit, two-color fluorescence for distinguishing between cells that are live and dead. We could look at apoptosis and monitor that pathway in the cells by doing a fluorescent imaging caspase assay on the Minimax. And then finally, we can tie it all together by looking at protein induction using the ScanLater Western Blot system. So all of this is done on the SpectrumX system. So I want to conclude by just asking you to imagine what you could do with a system like this. Great. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Uh, just a reminder that all of our presenters have kindly provided us with additional resources, and these can be accessed via the resource widget, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, our final speaker of the day uh, joins us from TCAN. Mike Cianci is a senior field application scientist at TCAN US for detection products. Mike has spent several years in the microplate instrument market, including time at Berthold and BMG. For the last 17 years, Mike has been with TCAN US managing sales in the Northeast US, and most recently in application support. Thank you for joining us today, Mike. Thank you, Trevor. So today I'm going to be speaking about some solutions uh, available from TCAN to optimize cell-based assays. There are some concerns that most people have when running cell-based assays, and um, 
certain conditions that need to be controlled and things that need to be monitored while cell-based assays are in process. So we're going to discuss uh, some TCAN solutions with respect to those, and then we'll um, delve into a few applications that we've, that we've highlighted which utilize some of our solutions. So why cell-based assays and microplates? Obviously, there's been a dramatic increase in the, in the, uh, the use of cell-based assays in the, in the recent past um, in both uh, biotech and pharma. The reason for this, obviously, is more biological relevance based on um, using live cell assays. So we see a progression from biochemical assays to lysate assays to a living cell assays. Why is there a general trend? Obviously, because the, the, the relevance of the data that we can obtain from live cell assays really accelerates the, the discovery process with respect to uh, drug candidates and safety and efficacy and just uh, helps expedite the, the entire process. So what are some common problems that people encounter using cell-based assays? Obviously, there are multiple washing steps and uh, media replacement steps where you're, you're dealing with, say, um, an adherent cell layer in your, in your microplate. So what's happening when you're washing your cells? And then what's happening while you're trying to monitor kinetically the assay? Are you inducing or are you introducing conditions that are going to interrupt or going to um, make hostile environmental changes to, to the cells while they're being grown? And during the detection process, you also want to make sure that am I detecting the entire cell layer? Am I missing things? What is the homogeneity of my cell layer? In, in my microplate well. And then finally, how am I going to control this? Am I, how am I going to ensure that I have uh, a monitoring system to, to make sure that things are working even when I'm not in the laboratory? So those are the things that we're going to try to address during this presentation. The first one is cell washing. So there are different ways you can wash cells. Obviously, people use manual methods. What we're highlighting on this slide is the hyperspeed uh, microplate washer from TCAN with its cell protection washing settings. With the hyperspeed, we can control many parameters that will ensure that the cell layer is, is not interrupted, and, and we're going to get good cell retention both with in this case, we we're highlighting two different cell lines, a strongly adherent cell line and a weakly adherent cell line, showing the, the retention that we get and the efficacy of the wash versus manual methods. We do that by controlling different positionings of the needles and the buffer dispensing and the aspiration rates and so on. The next slide is going to highlight the gas control module from TCAN. TCAN was the first company to introduce a GCM or gas control module, so kind of fusing the concept of a microplate reader and an incubator in one instrument. You can see the two plots that we show there on, on the right. One plot would be the one on the bottom is kind of the interrupted type of data you would get whilst performing an assay where you're constantly moving the microplate from the incubator into the plate reader to pick up periodic time points. And the plot on the top is the continuous monitoring of the cell-based assay within the microplate reader with environmental control from the gas control module. Another common problem with cell-based assays is the actual detection of the signal from the cells in the cell layer. So what this slide highlights is TCAN's exclusive optimal read mode where we not only drive to the center of the well and not only look at multiple points in the well, but we take the number of reads that are being used to assess the signal from the well, distributing them evenly over the area of the microplate well. And you can see the plots on the left will show you the corresponding reduction in coefficient of variation that we get between a standard microplate reader and then a TCAN reader without optimal read mode being employed 
and then the TCAN reader with optimal read mode being employed. So this gives you uh, a much more consistent look at what your data are and where the signal is coming from in the, in the well. The third thing that we're going to talk about is what's happening over the time course. What is happening while I'm not in the laboratory? And we're going to address that with TCAN's Common Notification System, or CNS. What this is is a remote monitoring system which allows you to, from your office or from your home, be able to take a peek in on your mobile phone to see what's occurring on your instrument whilst it's running your assay. We can use this for both our detection products and for our liquid handling products. So the common TCAN's common notification system is a system compatible with the following readers which all utilize the TCAN Magellan software. So this monitoring system will work with all models of the Infinity microflate reader line from Infinity 200 up to Infinity M1000 Pro. What are the benefits of doing this? Obviously, remotely you can take a look in and see what the CO2 and O2 concentrations that are being maintained by the gas control module. You can see where in the time course you are. You can, you can relay information back to the laboratory if, there's, if there needs to be some user intervention, like pipetting into the, into the well or changing something on the plate reader. We can get information about the cycle number, when the run was started, when is the projected end time, the stack of information, instruments about, I mean, information about power failure or anything that may have occurred to the instrument in your absence. So this, the CNS system utilizes a web server. So the CNS notifications are sent to the web server and then out to your mobile device. So you to operate, this, this slide shows you a, a pre, uh, sort of a preview of the screen that you would be able to see on your iPhone. It tells you the PC name, the application that's running, the signal status, the expected runtime, all relevant pieces of information that you might want to take a look at when you're not in the laboratory. This slide shows a couple of different statuses, um, one where the instrument is not connected and the software is not running, one where the instrument is idle but the software is running, and then an actual live run where you, the, the instrument is running and reporting data back to the CNS. This is the main view, so you have your current time, info about the expected duration of the experiment, Here's the detail view, so it's showing you the concentration of the uh, CO2 and O2. It's showing you the information on the kinetic cycle. So now we're going to go into a few things, a few different applications, which will highlight the use of both the gas control module and the CNS in the laboratory. This first application has to deal with um, detecting H1F inside TCAN's microplate reader. So this is an application which is going to depend a lot on the, the, the gas control module and the, in, the induction of hypoxia within the microplate reader over the time course. Now in this experiment, we have the NUNC edge plate to avoid evaporation over the long time course. This slide just shows you the utility of using the edge plate this is, I think, 72 hours worth of kinetic data, so the trough along the outside of the plate is filled with buffer or water, and then you can see in the plot on the left minimal edge effect over, over the long time course. This next slide shows the comparison between the induction of hypoxia within the plate reader compared to inducing hypoxia in an external incubator. And you can see there's two different you can see there are two different um, levels of hypoxia being highlighted there. The gas control module on the TCAN Infinity 200 Pro reader can reduce oxygen concentration down to 0.1% O2. The 
The next assay is real-time cytotoxicity measured over days. So this is a, 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 an assay, a simple assay, which is going to be able to assess the integrity of the cell membrane by using a fluorescent dye. So down in the lower left, you see intact cells. The dye is not being incorporated in the cell. And then on the, on the right-hand side of that diagram, the lysed cell and the dye being, being taken up and the, the fluorescence increasing over time. Now also for this application, we use the TCAN HPP300 digital dispenser, which is a non-contact dispensing system for compound delivery to the, to the microplate wells. This system will deliver compounds in picoliter quantities from DMSO sources. So in this slide, we see the results where we have our controls down in the bottom, not, not showing any increase in fluorescence. And then as the cytotoxicity increases, we see the increase in the, in the fluorescence signal for two different drugs. The next slide also highlights the gas control module. We have microaerophilic organisms. So these are, these are microorganisms which are not anaerobes. They do require oxygen, but it, at environmental levels of oxygen, they're not going to grow. It's going to be toxic. But at certain levels of O2, we're going to see um, increased cell growth. So this was done at a couple of different um, conditions. So we had no O2 regulation, so just atmospheric condition. And then 10% um, O2 and 5% O2 and 10% CO2 wow. over 28 hours at 37 degrees with continuous shaking. And then we were looking at um, just the proliferation via um, looking at expressed fluorescent protein and looking at OD600 to measure cell density. These measurements were done every hour. And if we take a look at these curves here, we can see in the control, uh, in the control data where there's no, OT, no O2 control, so 20% O2, we see no cell growth. And then the two different uh, reduced oxygen conditions induced by the gas control module, the 5% and the 10% O2. So we can see we do have some proliferation when using 10% O2. And then at the 5% at the O2, we see a nice growth curve. So the summary that we, that we are we're highlighting here is that the CNS can boost productivity. We can monitor the CO2 concentrations, check the status of our gas tank. We can um, use that information to contact people in the lab and, and, and induce actions. So if you're working with cells and worry about obtaining consistent data, these are things that available from TCAN, the gas control module, a complete line of multi-mode de detection readers, and CNS system to help you keep a handle on what's going on. So in conclusion, the TCAN HydroSpeed for washing cell-based assays, the TCAN Infinity 200 Pro Reader with gas control module for CO2 and O2 concentration, and the TCAN Common Notification System for remote monitoring of your assay's progress. TCAN periodically highlights applications in the TCAN journal. So this slide just is highlighting that. You can subscribe to this online, or there's even a paper subscription if you care to receive that. Some of the partners that we did men that we did utilize during us, these are highlighted on this slide. There's a list of teams that will be available in the, in the resource section of this presentation, all beginning with TCAN.com. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Trevor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if everybody's ready, I think we'll go directly into our question and answer session. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in from our audience, uh, and uh, maybe we'll uh, We'll talk, talk about uh, gas control uh, initially. 
Uh, how can you ensure that the, the chamber is holding uh, the desired uh, uh, percent O2 or CO2 and that the, the readers are air, airtight? This is Mike from TCAN US. Yep. So in, in, in our system, we, we have a series of sensors within the microplate reader constantly giving feedback to the gas control module, telling it whether it needs to pour additional gas into the system or not. Okay, hey, thank you. Can anybody else uh, add to that? Uh, this is yeah. Carl Peters with BMG Lab Tech. Um, yeah, and so we also have a, a, an atmospheric control unit for uh, the uh, Clarion Star as well as for um, other readers in our, in our lineup. And they work on a very similar uh, approach. Um, yeah, and I think, so I mean, I think that that's fairly standard. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of airtight, um, I don't think that that's uh, really achievable uh, within a microplate reader, but it is constantly being set, sensed and adjusted. Yeah, I would agree with that. This is Brad from Biotech. Um, you know, kind of the same thing with our gas control module. You have, you know, feedback systems which are, you know, uh, uh, helping to, you know, d determine the uh, the percent of, you know, whether it's CO2 or O2 or whatever within the imaging chamber. And I would agree. I mean, you're never going to prevent 100% of, um, you know, the of you know whatever gas you're sparging in from uh, from leaking out of the system, but again with the with the feedback mechanisms, you're able to uh, you know continually sparge in um, as needed to, to you know to maintain a very uh, tight um, you know window uh, around your set uh, your set oxygen you know concentration, whether that's you know five percent CO2 or you know uh, low oxygen settings for uh, you know hypoxia assays that type of thing. Thank you. Kathy or uh, Celeste, anything to add? Oh, no. We're good. Nope. nope. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, but the next question is, uh, you know, there, there appears to be a lot of different readers on the market. So how do you uh, uh, choose one that, that suits your workflow and, and are there particular features that uh, you should look for for high throughput applications? Uh, hi, this is Kathy from Molecular Devices. Hi, yeah, so I think the, the features that you should look for would be based on the applications that you're doing. I mean, if you're doing um, cell-based assays and you need um, uh, imaging capability, we look for that. If you need the capability to do um, to look at protein expression um, via imaging and via Western blot, and you could use the scan later system. Um, so it really depends on the application that you're looking at. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, you you um, you know those are excellent points, Kathy. I mean, you could also throw in um, again. You know, do you want to do long term? Uh, you know, kinetic assays, you know, then you can obviously uh, look at, you know, do you need to have um, temperature and gas control, uh, you, know, al uh, you know, alpha assays, alpha LISA, alpha screen are still popular, so, you know, do you want to have the integration of, um, of a laser to make sure that you have, you know, can get proper results from those types of, uh, of assays, or do you need, um, you know, is speed really the most important thing, so you can, uh, you know, are you looking for, uh, you know, a, a reader uh, that can provide, you know, simultaneous uh, detection, you know, maybe you're using an FP assay or a, a, a FRET type of an assay and you want to be able to detect uh, the, the signal from both channels at the same time instead of having to, uh, to read once with one channel and then read a second time. So, you know, it, it really, it's, again, like Kathy said, it, it depends on what's really the most important thing for you and what are your uh, key applications that you want to, uh, that you want to run with, uh, with, with the reader that you choose. Uh, this is Mike from TCAN. I would also just add to that a big consideration is going to be the environment. The multi, is it a multi-user environment or is it a, a limited number of users? That's going to help determine the most appropriate instrument um, or the most type of the the the, the uh, most appropriate type of instrument to be used. And typically, what what we found at TCAN is in a multi-user environment that a tunable wavelength reader typically is going to be the most appropriate instrument. Um, 
and an instrument that doesn't require a whole lot of hands-on from the user. So something that's simple to use and gives flexibility. This is Carl from uh, BMG Lab Tech. Um, I mean, everybody has uh, provided some great points, and I think that I'll you know just reiterate you know the flexibility of detection is really important. Um, you know, knowing exactly what you want the reader to be able to do in terms of what detection technologies um, uh, you want to be able to perform, and making sure that you've selected something that's going to match up with uh, with those expectations. Um, and that's going to do that with uh, the greatest sensitivity that you can you can have, um, and uh, you know, in, in terms of the high throughput, do it uh, do it fast, um, and be able to do it in a miniaturized format. Um, and so, you know, it really does come down to you have to sit down with your with your team and decide what's what's the most important things for you. And you know, when you put together a list, you have to then look at. Who, uh, who fulfills those expectations? Great, thank you. Uh, now, how important is it to maintain uh, ambient temperature and humidity? For example, can these uh, systems be used in cold rooms? Uh, Celeste or Kathy, maybe I'll start you off with that. Hi, this is Celeste Glazer from Molecular Devices. They, they can be used in a cold room, but I'm not sure what the application that you're re referring mm -hmm. to. Um, I think they can be used in all different types of environments. We have temperature control, and as you, as you mentioned, there's other ways of controlling. You can seal a plate. Um, do you, can you comment about the application that someone would be using in a cold room? You know, I, I, I don't have that information, but, uh, but they are flexible enough to, uh, to control temperature, uh, you know, at, Sure, yeah. degrees Celsius, let's say. Great, thanks. Carl Anybody? Peters uh, with, Carl Peters with BMG yeah. Lab Tech. I don't think that, I mean, I'm not aware of instrumentation that has the cooling capability, um, but yeah. yeah, they certainly are capable of being used in a, a an environment where you are decreasing the temperature. Um, you know, that's not what they were probably initially designed to do, um, but it's, um, it's certainly a capability that I know several users have inquired about uh, uh, for BMG equipment, and um, we have no problem with uh, the users being able to, to move instruments into the cold room. Um, I think it's uh, usually important if you have, you know, unstable proteins that you are looking to detect, um, things of that nature. Um, so if you're looking at protein expression uh, or purification profiles, um, you would need to, to, to work at a, a reduced temperature. This is Mike from TCAN. I'll just add to that that um, people often use these type of instruments in cold rooms. What they need to consider is, you know, when they're moving it into the cold room, the equilibration time, the, the uh, amount of humidity in the cold room with respect to condensing on components within the the instrument, and then when the instrument is removed from the cold room, again the equilibration time back to ambient temperature. Yeah, yeah, I would I would pretty much totally agree with that. This is Brad from uh, Biotech. The the um, you know humidity usually isn't a problem. It's the you know ability to control uh, condensation, obviously, you know, on the electronics, that type of thing. So if, you know, it can be a humid environment, I mean, obviously we have, you know, we have readers that are used in, you know, Singapore and, and Southeast Asia, which obviously are, are you know, quite uh, high relative humidity just, you know, just because of where they are in the world. But um, the ability to control uh, the condensation on um, on the on the instrument, and again, particularly on the electronics, is really going to uh, kind of be the the main um, uh, factor to uh, to consider. Yeah, we have an M2 in Africa, and it hasn't hasn't been a problem. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have uh, looking at the clock. I think we have time for probably one more question. Um, and I'll, uh, maybe I'll start, uh, Brad, I'll start you off with this. Uh, what does the, uh, the, the future look like for microplate technologies? Are we seeing, uh, uh, expecting incremental improvements or, or do you see game changers on the horizon? 
Well, uh, we'd like to think that our, I mean, I, I think what we see at biotech is the, you know, more and more, I mean, microplate reading is obviously always going to be extremely important, but the ability to also, um, you know, see what's going on via imaging um, is, is becoming more and more and more um, important, uh, you know, to really, you know, more and more people want to do uh, phenotypic type of um, assays, and uh, imaging assays are, are many times very uh, geared to uh, phenotypic type of um, uh, responses. Um, you know, we saw examples of looking at uh, apoptosis or um, you know, general uh, or um, uh, hypoxia or oxidative stress, you know, these are phenotypic types of uh, responses to really get a better look at what's happening with, uh, um, with the cells as a, as a whole and not just uh, target-based um, uh, results, which, which many times aren't uh, totally indicative of, of what's going to go on um, in, an, in an in vivo situation. So we really feel that the ability to, you know, to incorporate imaging uh, into a system, you know, and, and get a combination of, uh, um, of results is really going to, you know, again, become more and more, it already is important, but just going to keep uh, increasing um, as, uh, as we move on into the future. Thank you. Can anybody else add to that? Hi, this is Sean uh, Glazer from Molecular Devices. I also think that um, coming out with some of the, the newest technology, Nano TRF is one that, that we're coming out, which I think will be um, a really novel technology, as well as combining a reagent with systems so that scientists can have a, a clear uh, understanding that the results are going to are going to match what they typically see. Um, I think a lot of times people are optimizing reagents, and so it takes a lot of time. So knowing that you're going to get a system that has reagents and software that work together, I think helps, um, and I think will be a game changer in the future, as well as um, as some of these latest technologies like, such as nano TRF and, and miniaturization. Hey, thank you. Anyone else add? Well, I do think that um, you know continued uh, additions to flexibility uh, of instrument performance. So um, being able to incorporate uh, new detection technologies, or um, being able to uh, multiplex uh, different detection technologies, is going to be um, an important aspect. Um, so uh, I think that it's clear that multiple approaches are going to be important uh, for, for the uh, scientists to be able to um, analyze multiple aspects of, uh, of their, of their uh, system um, at one time, um, be that with uh, imaging um, or with uh, the, the ability to multiplex uh, different detection technologies into one, uh, in, into one assay. Um, so really, um, and, and, and also then, you know, expanding what you can get out of each well. So maximizing really the, the performance um, of each well and getting all the information you can out of each individual well. Great, thank you. Anybody else have uh, any last words? No? Boy, well, thank you for your presentation. Oh, no. Well, thank you very much, and this brings us to the end of today's webinar. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the panelists directly, as they are the true experts in this field. Their contact information, as you can see, is available on the screen now. Again, just a reminder that today's webinar video will be available at the link you see on the screen. And on behalf of Lab Manager, I'd like to thank our panelists today for their hard work that they put into their presentations. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, BMG Lab Tech, Biotech Instruments, Molecular Devices, and TCAN for supporting our Tech Trends webinar series. As well, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. You may wish to join us for our next Tech Trends uh, webinar, which will focus on forensic science techniques. This webinar will be taking place Thursday, November 6, from noon until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For more information, please visit our website at www.labmanager.com. We hope you can join us again next time. Thank you, and have a great day.